this. Can you hear me okay? We are on. Now, do I have a, uh, Jeremy, do I have a clicker or do I have to go up here? I have my own clicker. Can I plug it in? I've got a clicker. Yes. This is an SQLite clicker, mind you. <laughs> it is not just your average clicker. Yeah. No, I can't. I can't talk without moving my arms. Where is the um? Right. If if yeah, I can't can't do that. I'm already live. Okay. Thank you. Um. Unfortunately, I think we only have a single USB port on this machine. Oh, here's another one. And we're on. We're not on. Oh, we are working. It's just slow to respond. Thanks, everybody, for coming. My name is Richard Hip. The title of this. Um, I need to. My headset is kind of being weird on me here. Hold on. It feels like it's going to fall off my head. Okay. Okay. Thank you for being here. My name is Richard Hip. This is a talk on Git and why you shouldn't be using it in its current form. Really, this is going to be a talk about what we can do to make Git better. Um, here, the, the a complete copy of the slides in the original open office format there if you want to download them. Uh, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Do I need to be somewhere else? Do I need to stand on the stage maybe? It's buzzing. Don't worry about the buzzing. Okay, so uh, this talk is about Git. Now, just to be upfront with you, I am the creator and primary developer for a competing version control system, but I'm not here to push my system. This is about Git because really they're both about 10 years old and Git has clearly won mind share. Everybody uses Git. Uh, raise your hand if you are using Git. Raise your hand if you want to be using Git. Raising hand, your, your hand if you want to be using, or if you are using Git but wish you were not. Yes. Okay. So Git is the software that everybody seems to love to hate, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what some of its problems are and what we can do to fix them. Now, as I said, I'm, I'm, I, I, wrote, I write a competing system. I'm not pushing that today, but my decade of experience writing and maintaining this system informs my criticism of Git. But before we start, get, before we get going, um, I have a, a collection of, of quotes about Git, and, and I, I would love to collect these. If you see any, let me know. I brought along a few of my favorites here. This is a recent one uh, from Benjamin Pollock. Git is so amazingly simple to use that A-Press, a single publisher, needs three different books on how to use it. It's so simple that uh, Atlassian and GitHub both need, feel the need to write their own online tutorial to clarify the main Git tutorial on the actual Git website. It's so transparent that developers routinely tell me that the easiest way to learn Git is to start with the file formats and work up to the commands. So um, here's, I love this one. This was uh, Jonathan Hartley. It's simplest to think of the state of your Git repository as a point in high dimensional code space in which branches are represented as the n-dimensional membranes mapping spatial loci of successive commits onto the projected manifold of each cloned repository. And if you understand what that means, you should probably be using Git. Uh, this is from Nick Farina, co-founder of Meridian. Meri this is a different Meridian from the people who are right outside that door showing. This is a different company, but he wrote, Git is not a Prius. Git is a Model T. It's plumbing and wiring stick out all over the place. You have to be a mechanic to operate it successfully or you'll be stuck on the side of the road when it breaks down, and it will break down. Emphasis as in the original. So, and this and this was in an article really pushing Git. Git's the greatest thing in the world. But he he's really upfront about its limitations. 
I've got a ton of these, but my favorite is the next one. This is this is my all time favorite from a guy named T Stain on Reddit. Klingon code warriors embrace Git. We enjoy arbitrary conflicts. Git is not for the weak and feeble. Today is a good day to code. So, you know, you're all Git users, you're laughing at this. And so the reason you're laughing is because you know it's true. So um, here are my top 10 things that I think top 10 needed enhancements needed for Git. Now, I've got a longer list. I tried to limit it to 10. And I tried to order them, I think, in order of importance. So I'm going to start with the first one up here, show the descendants of a check-in. This is a showstopper for me. Because Git does not do this well, is I, I can't use Git. I have to use a different system. What do I mean by that? Um, you know, uh, if, you, if you think to the, if you think back to how Git is implemented, and apparently in order to use Git successfully, you kind of have to know the low-level data structures, um, you've got this, this linked list of commit objects. Now, there's four different types of objects in the file format. There's commit objects, tree objects, blob objects, and tag objects. But we're only dealing with commit objects here. And, and of course, they have a, a, each one has a complete SHA-1 hash label. I have shortened the label on these to a single hex digit just for readability. So you're, the first check-in was commit number nine. And, uh, and so that blob goes in there, and that's great. And then there were some additional check-ins after that, which were E and F. And it was a, it, it forked. There was a branch there. And the F branch went up to D, and the E branch went up to C. And then, then there was a merge operation at B. And then A is the latest. A is head. And each one of these commit objects has a pointer to its parents. So it forms a graph just like this. And in the Git documentation, it does show the graphs going this way. So the, the arrows are pointing backwards in time, which is kind of counterintuitive. I mean, yeah, this is the way you need to implement it under the covers, definitely. But, you know, users ought to see the graphs going forward and, or the arrows going for, forward in time. But the thing is, you know, if, if, you're, if you're sitting at E and you want to what, wonder what comes next, there's nothing here to tell you. You can follow the arrow and find its parents, but you can't find its children. And there's no way to go in, you know, after somebody commits C, you can't look at E and you can't modify E to add a list of parents because if you were to modify E, that would change its hash and it would become a different check-in. It would become a different commit. So there's no way to do that. Um, and this is a big, and, and for that reason, if you, if you look at any of the user interfaces, it's very, very difficult to find the descendants of a check-in. Uh, how do we solve this? Uh, I propose solving it by having a shadow table off the side. You keep the, keep the same internal data structure because that, that's the way you need to do this. But we could, you could make a, a, a table in a relational database uh, that keeps track of the parent-child relationship. And so I've got a little simple table here, and it's got the parent hash, the child hash, and then rank is a field that says whether or not this is um, a merge check-in or if it's the primary, or the, the merge parent or primary parent. So let's look how this goes. Um, we see that uh, uh, A has a parent, which is B, on the first entry here. So B is the parent. A is the child, and the rank is zero because it's the primary parent. It's, it's not a merge. Um, B is a child of two different check-ins, both C and D. C is its primary parent, and D is its merge parent. And you can have a three-way merge, too, and then you number it that way. And, and you can see how uh, this table very succinctly represents this graph. In fact, you could, this is not like a primary data structure. You could build this table just by looking at the, at the Git log. You could build this table very quickly. And then once you have this table, um, it becomes very simple to do a query to get the children or the parents of a particular check-in. So, and, and if you have an index on this table or appropriate indices on this table, then that query becomes very, very fast. 
And this allows you to, to um, find the ancestors. So, and if you want to get, and of course you can, you can do more complicated things with this. So for example, usually what you want to do is you've got to check in and you want to say, what came afterwards? You want to say, find the 50 most recent descendants in time of a particular check-in to see what was happening. So somebody checks in a bug, you find out about it two years later. Okay, what was the follow-on to this? And um, for this example, I've added another field to the table called M time, which is just a timestamp. And then I just, and then using a simple uh, recursive common table expression, I can immediately get the 50 most recent uh, and uh, descendants of, of that check-in. Now, um, this is just a single, a simple SQL query. It's a, um, a not a common thing. It uses a common table expression. And if you don't know what that is, there's actually a talk by me right after lunch, and you can come and I will explain how this works to you. But the point is, it's, a, it's a, just a simple query and gives you this. Now, you could do this by, you could do the same thing by looking through the Git log and doing lots of complete table scans. It would be a lot of code. It would take a lot of, it would be slow. And I note, after 10 years of intensive use with lots of user interfaces, nobody does it. And so this information is just not available to people who want it. Now you could do all sorts of other interesting queries if you had this table. So for example, you could find all of the check-ins that occurred during some interval of time. Uh, and that's just by selecting, doing a select on the table with the end time between two end values that you've selected. I do this kind of thing all, all the time because in my repositories, I keep, I keep separate uh, components of a project in separate repositories. So the SQLite source code is in one repository. The documentation is in another repository. Some of these test cases are in the original source repository, but I have other, several other repositories that contain additional test cases. So uh, I get an email or a phone call from a client and say, well, we, we've got a problem with this version of SQLite that's three years old. And we go back and we, we, we bisect to trace a particular check-in and we're trying to, well, why did we make this change? Well, we want to see what's happening in the other related repositories at about the same time. So we can kind of go back and remember what we were thinking three years ago. I don't know about you, but I cannot remember what I was thinking two years ago this week. Can, 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 do you even know where you were two years ago this week? I don't. So, I, but, but by doing this query, I can go back and get a complete listing. Say again? Yeah, the, the, the answer was that we were probably here two years ago this week. But by doing a query like this, I can go back and get a complete listing of what was happening in all of the relevant repositories. And oh yeah, that's when we were working on such and such a feature. And now I see why we made this change. This happens on a daily basis for me. It's not easy to do with the current Git structure. Uh, what are the 30 closest check-ins to a particular point in time? Same kind of thing where, you know, uh, we've got a, a change that we're investigating. We know that this change introduced a bug. What was happening at, 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 around that point in time? Not necessarily on that same branch, maybe on parallel branches. What were we doing at the same time? This is a very important thing when you're tracking bugs, and, and uh, a, a system like this allows you to do it. You know, I forgot to mention when I was showing you the original chart that this table that we've got here, this lineage table, it's not really a primary data structure in the sense that it's not holding any new information. All of the information that's in this table is in the original Git objects. And if the, this table came out of date, for some reason, some software bug or something, you could just delete the whole thing, rescan the Git log, and rebuild the table anytime you want. And you know, my particular version control system does, you know, has the same kind of situation. And there's a rebuild command. You just you know, type rebuild, and it actually rebuilds this table from primary sources. So here's an example of doing 30, the 30 nearest check-ins in time, and it's just a, a, a um, a couple of selects with a union and ordered by time differences and limit to the first 30. And that's very fast. So, and, and you could do something like this. And so I, I imported um, the complete 
Git repository for Git itself into a different version control system and then ran this query on it just to find out what was the old what were the oldest commits in Git itself. And so these were the first five commits to Git itself. And I was amused by the very first one where Linus checked in the very first code to Git. And he says, his own words, the initial revision of Git, I don't know if you can see this, the information manager from hell. So you can you can actually see this in the Git repo. It's right in here at the bottom. This is the very first check-in. Notice in this particular rendition, the arrows point forward in time rather than backward in time, which I personally find more intuitive. But um, you can you can get the same information by doing git log and then piping it through tail. And, and you can just see the last few entries. Yes. There's also a git log reverse that prints them in, in, in reverse order. I did not know about that one. I did time it. Um, this took three milliseconds. When I did git log and piped it through tail, that took the better part of a second. So this is faster. Um, okay, so that's, 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 the, that's the big complaint I have about git, is that I can't go back and explore the history. It's just this 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 linked list with the arrows going the opposite direction that I normally want to go. Uh, the next big problem I have with Git is it has an overly complex mental model. Uh, in particular, if you're working in Git, you need to keep in your mind five different snapshots or five different commits. You need to remember what's in your working directory, the, the files that you're editing right now, you need to remember what is in the index or staging area. You need to be mindful of your local head, the branch that you're working on. You need to be aware of the local copy of the remote head. That is your copy of what's going to be on the server. And then also you need to be aware of what is actually the remote head. And there are commands in Git to move information between all five of these things. Really, if you're a developer, you really only need to be concerned with two of these, which is the first one and the last one, your working directory and what's actually on the server, what everybody else sees. All this other stuff in the middle, B, C, and D, is just complication. Git forces you to keep in your mind two and a half times more information than you really need. And you know, every one of us has a finite number of brain cycles. You can only think about so much at a time. And my view is that the version control system should get out of your way and use as few brain cycles as possible so that you can devote as many brain cycles as possible to whatever project it is you're working on. And having to keep in mind B, C, and D seems to just be stealing cycles from, from your normal thinking activity. So one of the first things that I think really ought to go is, and of course, these things can be available in, in the rare cases where they're actually needed. Uh, one of the first things I think needs to go is the staging area. I mean, I talked to a lot of people about this, and, and if you have any views, I'd really like you to share them. Uh, some people are fanatical about the Git index. It's a great thing, and I ask them why. And the usual answer as I get is that, well, it allows you to do a partial commit. Every other version control system in the world allows you to do a partial commit too, and they don't have a staging area. So I'm not sure why that's the advantage. Um, the, the fact that you've got the differences between what you're committing to and the local head and the remote head, that these don't automatically stay in sync there may be cases where that would be a desirable thing, but those are the exceptions, not the rule. Usually when you want, when you do a commit, you'd like it to immediately, yeah, you, you, you keep it on your machine, but you'd like it to immediately go out to the server so that everybody else can see it too. Now, you know, sometimes you're off network and that doesn't work and so you have to be aware of these things, but that's the exception, not the rule. The usual case is that you want it to go immediately and automatically, yes. Some people say that's not their usual case. Um, 
but you know the people I talk, um, the experience I have, and you know when I was originally doing the dis distributed version control system, doing my own, it worked the same way where you would have to explicitly push as a separate step. And we developed some experience with that after a while, and we eventually found out that it works a whole lot better to automatically push. So every time you commit, it automatically pushes. And this really solves a lot of problems. In fact, uh, there were um, uh, some, some users on, on, on the mailing list of my system recently, and sometimes you can get in a race condition where two people commit at the same time are nearly the same time, and and there's a, a race to see who pushes first, and it would automatically create a branch and everything, and and they were upset about that 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 they weren't getting enough feedback that there were two people committing at the same time, and so it goes beyond just automatic. They want not only automatic, but they want automatic notification that other people have committed as well, and and all this other thing. This is what people really want, in my experience. Uh, number three, Git doesn't really store your branch history. In, in the Git world, a branch is just a symbolic name for the most recent uh, commit on the end of one of these commit chains. And as you commit new things on there, that, that pointer moves. So it doesn't really remember the name of the branch where it originally got committed. Now you can kind of use some inference and figure it out so that some of the tools will show you this, but it's not really first class branch history. I, when, when you're doing uh, analysis of, and people um, come back to you and you need to go back and look at what was happening two or three years ago, you often want to know what branch was this check-in originally checked in on? Where, where was this originally, what was the original name of the branch? Or what are all the historical branches that we've had on this project with their starting and ending dates? And how were they finally resolved? Were they merged? Are they still active? Were they abandoned? What was the, what was the solution there? Um, list all the historical branches. I, I want to do a bisect only over this particular branch. So uh, a lot of times what we do is, of course, bisect is very important to us. So what will be, somebody will want to implement a new feature and they'll do a sequence of check-ins in a branch and then they'll merge that branch onto the trunk. And, but then later on when we're doing a bisect, we don't want to bisect into all these little incremental changes where they're adding the feature. We want just that one case where they added it. But because there's no branch history in Git, uh, they, there's, there's no way to keep up with this. You can kind of make inferences based on, 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 uh, on the, the, the commit logs, but it's, it, there, there's, there's no permanent record of the name of the branch where things were committed. I didn't think this was real important. I asked for feedback from the user community, and a lot of people are saying, this is my number one complaint in Git, is that it forgets the name of my branches. Uh, number four. Multiple checkouts from the same repository. Right now with Git, a, the, the working area is part of the repository. You can only have one working area per repository. If you're working on something, you've got your project all taken apart, you're in the middle of big editing, an email or a phone call comes in that requires you to go back and look at something historical, well, you've got, you can stash your work, but that's, that's kind of bad because you kind of, even, even with the stash, you're going to lose context. Uh, you can clone your repository to a new repository and then go back and look at the historical version in the clone, but that's just, and you can work around it that way, but it's unsatisfying. Uh, it would be so much nicer if you just had a, a repository and then you could have multiple working directories sitting on different checkouts from that one repository. People who, who have worked in both systems tell me repeatedly this is a very important thing to them. Multiple checkouts from the same repository. Uh, sliced and cloned checkouts. Uh, or sliced checkouts and clones, excuse me. So a slice would be 
this is this is kind of a feature that you had with Subversion and CVS, where you've got like a massively wide uh, project, like NetBSD. If you ever look at their repository, they have the entire user space with 60,000 different files all in one repository. It's massive. And most people don't want all 60,000 files. They only want to look at one subdirectory. Or they only want to work on one subdirectory. And so a slice checkout means I want to check out or clone something, but I don't want the entire repository. I just want this one subdirectory. Uh, wouldn't it be great if you could do that? There's really no technical reason why you can't. It's just that it isn't supported. Yes. What is a shallow? So a shallow clone is where you clone a repository, but you don't get all of its history. Um, yeah, that's that's another thing that's nice to have, and that that is a new feature. How long have shallow clones been around? It's just been like a year or two, hasn't it? So um, the other thing a lot of people request, and Git does support this now, is that you've got a, a project that goes back 10 years. If I want to access this project, why do I have to load 10 years of history? Can I get by with just loading two months of history and, and save bandwidth? That's a shallow clone, and they've got that. But we're, all, we're talking about a slice clone, where so a shallow clone is slicing it this way. A, a slice is doing it this way. And so it would be nice to be able to do a slice and a shallow clone. Yes, question. So the, the, the comment is that on some projects, the directories move around and things change, and so the slicing doesn't work as well there. So don't slice on that project. But on some projects, like NetBSD, the directory structure stays the same for like 25 years. And, and, and they want to do this sort of thing. And, and so, yeah. Yes, question. The, the point it, the, 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 the point was raised that the git solution or the I'm, I'm going to go beyond git and just say the distributed version control solution because they all have this problem including the one I wrote um, the, 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 the distributed version control solution for this problem is to have separate repositories for each one of your little components that you might want to load yeah it's kind of a workaround though isn't it because you've got that means you have to predict in advance which uh, directories are going to be of interest as a separate piece and historically we've not been really good at predicting that so that's not a, it would be much better and, and the software could in theory do it it's just be able to, to clone or check out a, a slice that would work a lot better um, checkouts and commits against a remote repository right now in order to work and get you have to make a clone it has to be on your local machine everything has to be local and I'm asking why is that well, I know the technical reasons why, but from a user's perspective, that seems like an unnecessary burden. Now, if you're an active developer, yeah, you do want your local copy. And if, you, if you're going to be working off network, definitely you want a local copy, and that should probably be the default. But if I'm just out on GitHub somewhere and I see some interesting project and I want to look at it and look at the source code, why do I have to clone the entire 15-year history just to look at the latest version? Why can't I just check out directly from GitHub? without cloning. That seems like it's something to be really easy to do. For that matter, if I make a change, why can't I, why can't I commit it back? Why do I? Yeah, there, there, are, there are advantages. If you're doing a lot of work on a project, it's certainly better to have it local. But if it's just an occasional thing, why, why do I have to do that? Why can't I commit and go over a network? OK, the next one is a BusyBox version of Git. Do you know what BusyBox is? Who knows what BusyBox is? BusyBox is, of course, the um, uh, that single program that has all of the unit standard Unix command line utilities built in. Now, this is not a perfect analogy because BusyBox also has limitations; it doesn't do the full thing. But right now, when you install Git, it installs what is it, 134 different programs? You know, because each each Git command is implemented by a different executable. And all of these little programs get put in a special directory somewhere. And then the one Git program looks at the argument and says, oh, I want to run this one. It's got 
a huge number of dependencies. It's, it's this big pile of stuff. And a lot of people tell me that they really want a version control system that's just a, a, an executable. They, they download an executable, git.exe, or git if you're in Linux, and you put it on your path, and it works. There's nothing to install. You don't have to have app git. If you want to upgrade, you can put it in a, a change root jail. If you want to upgrade, you just overwrite the old one with the new one. If you want to uninstall it, you just delete the binary. Very simple. Whereas with git, you really have to have something like app git just to manage it. This is now... You know, a, a big pile of programs like that, that's great for development work. It's great for an, uh, an application. It works fine for development work when you're prototyping. But for a, a mature product that's 10 years old that everybody's using, you'd think that there would be some better packaging for it, you know, so that people can just download it really quickly. I hear a lot of people, they work in companies where they're going on a trip, they have to check out a laptop. They don't have their own laptops. You check out a laptop and it comes pre-configured and it doesn't have the version control system you want. So for them, they have to go and install Git. Wouldn't it be better just to have a single binary they could just plop there on the machine? All comms via HTTP or HTTPS. So my wife is a faculty member at UNCC, the local university. And I go over on campus a lot, and over there they have guest Wi-Fi, Niner, Niner Guest. This man right here is probably in charge of Niner Guest. <laughs> so I am, I am grateful. I am, I am grateful for you know having the free Wi-Fi access. Uh, but you know, like so much of the world, they confuse. They they think that the internet and the World Wide Web are the same thing. That means that Niner Guest only allows you to use TCP port 80 and 443. Those are the only two options, okay? So you cannot secure shell into your back into your server. And, and furthermore, you can't run any other protocols that don't run over port 80 and don't look like HTTP when you're on Niner Guest. And it's not just UNCC that does this. There's a lot of places that do this. I hear a lot of people... They, they, they use my alternative version control system because it does just use HTTP. And they, we use it because it's the only one that will penetrate our corporate firewall. <laughs> you know, uh, there's nothing about Git that couldn't be finagled to work over HTTP. It's just that they don't. So I, I think that's something that would be very important to add. Make, greatly improve their usability. I think there needs to be a git all command. Um, this is a thing we did where a git all means it works on all, it keeps track of all of your repositories. As I said, I, I typically have, I have dozens of repositories open on my desktop at any particular point in time. And I lose track of them. I can't remember them all. So I'm working all day, I'm working on all these different projects and different repositories and I get to the end of the day and uh, I'd like to be able to say, get all status. And it's going to go around and it's going to find all of my repositories and it's going to do a status on them to show me what I haven't, what I forgot to commit. Um, the way it would do this, of course, is there's already a, a dot .git file in your home directory that keeps track. Isn't it called dot .git? Well, in, no, in your, in your home directory that keeps track of the, uh, the, your username and, and all that stuff dot git config. Okay, so there's already that file. And every time you run a git command, it's going to consult that file. It's going to read it. So, and, and people complain, well, you can't keep track of all of the repositories because you can freely move them around. Somebody can just you know, do a move command and move it to a different place. And that's fine. So this, the, the dot git config keeps track of the last known position of a git command. So every time you run a git command, it says, okay, this repository I've, I've just read git config. Is my repository that I'm working on, is it listed in the git config? Usually it will be. If it's not, let's add it. And then when you run a git all command, it actually goes down the list of possible git repositories. But then it checks each one to see if it still is because you might have moved it away. So this is easy to implement that way. And it's not, so it's not 100%, but 
in practice, it works well enough. So, like, I'm working on my desktop, and of course, I don't use Git, but I use a different system. But if I were using Git, I'm working on my desktop, and I'm getting ready to go on the road, and I've got all these things here, I can do git all push. It pushes everything out to the server. And then I go over to my laptop, and I do git all pull, and it makes sure that everything is synced. And then I can go off network on my laptop. And I don't have to worry that I forgot about one of the critical projects, one of my critical repos. It's a very important thing. And finally, git serve. No, that's not finally. There's a bonus question at the end. Git serve. This, uh, anybody use Mercurial? You know about the serve command? Do you use hg serve? Okay, and the, the comment from the, from the audience was, this is exactly why we use Mercurial rather than Git is because it has a serve command. So what this does is it, it, it kicks up a, a um, but, but you know, Mercurial doesn't really go far enough in my point of view. And let me, let me tell you. So, so if you do HG sir, it starts up a, a web server, a little web server running there, and then you can point your web browser at it and get lots of really useful information about your repository. Um, uh, the one I implement for my system goes one step further. When you type fossil UI, it starts up the server, and it also causes your favorite web browser to pop up on that page. Okay, so there's, so with Mercurial, it's a two-step process. You have to start the server, and then you have to type the URL into the web browser. Mine does them both in one step. But the point is, there's this very rich environment. Now, I know that you, there are lots of tools out there for giving you a web interface to your Git repository. Uh, but you know what? They're a separate install. They usually require that you also have Apache there, too, and there's lots of requirements, and there's a big setup, and it's, you know, and, and, you're, and people do it on a server or something like that because, you know, you've taken the time to set it up. But wouldn't it be really cool if every time you had a repository, you automatically had a server and you could just say, git serve, and immediately your web browser pops up and you've got all this graphical, historical information that you just click around and find. If you had that, if you had been using this for a couple of weeks, I promise that you would never... You, you, you would never believe that you got along without it. This is a very amazing thing. I'm probably blazing through these slides way faster than I thought. How much more time do I have? 20 minutes, a lot of time for answer, questions and answers. But I do have one bonus feature. This is um, uh, a thing that I've never personally needed, but I hear from a lot of people they would really like to have advisory locks. What do I mean by this? This is coming from the game development community. Uh, when you're developing with ASCII text files, the, uh, the well, let me take you backwards in time to some of the older version control systems. And this, if, 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 you're, if you're younger than me, you may not remember some of these. Um, so those things like SCCS and RCS. And the way these things worked is that when you would do a checkout, all of your files would come out read-only, and you couldn't edit them. And if you wanted to change a file, you had to do a special checkout for editing, which would then lock the file so that nobody else, only one person could have it checked out for editing at a time. And that way, you would never get a, a conflict of any kind, because only one person would be editing a file at a time. Of course, the big downfall of that approach is that somebody would check something out for editing, and then immediately leave for a two-week vacation. And, and so we, then we'd have to go running around finding an administrator to unlock it and so forth. But, uh, and so CVS came along, and it gave you the ability to just edit without having to check out for editing. And that was the coolest feature in the world. That was just amazing. I know that it's very popular these days for people to be bad-mouthing CVS. And I recognize that CVS has limitations and it is an older technology. But if you've ever, you know, those of us who've had to use what came before CVS will never speak ill of CVS. So, but, and, but so now we have all this really cool merging stuff so that we, you, you, you know, when two people make simultaneous changes, they get merged together. 
that works great for text files. It does not work for JPEGs. It does not work for MPEGs. It does not work for these binary resources that are a big part of game development, for example, but also other things. And so a lot of people would love to have the ability to, in, in, the, in the main server, the, the central repository, put an advisory lock. Says, I'm editing this JPEG. And so if somebody else tries to edit that JPEG, they'll get a warning. Now, it's an advisory lock so that, you, you know, if they start editing and then go on vacation, you don't have to go hunt up a, an administrator in order to fix it. But it still gives you, it, it helps you coordinate um, uh, editing of binary resources that way. So there's, we've had a progression of open source uh, version control systems. I mean, in the old days, there's SCCS and RCS, and then there were CVS and Subversion, which were huge, huge innovations. And then Git came along. You know, Git was really based on this thing called Monotone, which I think really kind of pioneered the idea of distributed version control systems. But uh, so, but Git was the one that was successful. And but that's ten. That's been ten years. And and, and the question: Well, what is and, and Git has really, other than the other than adding a few features around the edges, such as the shallow clone, Git really hasn't advanced any in 10 years. It hasn't added any, anything new much. And so my question is, what is going to come next? I've outlined some ideas here about what I think, the direction I think version control needs to go. I'm hopeful that some of you guys might be interested in going out and hacking on Git and, and implementing some of these ideas. Um, Maybe somebody who's watching the video <laughs> would like to go hack on these ideas. If you have other ideas, criticisms, or complaints, if, if you think that I'm completely off base on this, I'd really like to hear from you. Again, I don't use Git on a daily basis. I use a different system that I wrote myself. And so I'm, I can be some, somewhat out of touch. If you, if you think I'm completely off base, I really do want to understand your point of view. So please give me feedback. That is the extent of my talk, and so I will be happy to take questions, comments, criticisms at this point. Who? All right, so we already said everybody. Right, you got a question in the back? No, no. I was going to say um, we've already established everybody here is using Git. Is that correct? All right, who's who's also using Subversion? Raise your hand if you are a current or a current Subversion user, a former Subversion user. Okay, CVS. Current sub CVS users. Nobody's still using CVS. Uh, former CVS users. Some uh, uh, Mercurial. Mercurial. Who's using Mercurial? Uh, something different. Uh, call out. Call out what you got. Darks and RC, uh, RCS. No, sure enough. I had just one file. Okay. All right. Yes. Okay. Well, you know what? I, even you know, e even when I have just one file, I'll set up a repository for that one file, and then I will also set up a clone on a server somewhere. And then on my system, every time I do a check-in, it automatically pushes it to the, and that's my backup. So you know. Anyway, are right, you so a different one? Perforce. Perforce. How do you like Perforce? It gets the job done. It gets the job done. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, another one, a very obscure one called Fossil that I might not have heard of. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. So, um, what are your preferences? Are you happy with Git? I see a lot of heads going this way. You're happy with Git? You like it? Okay, so the comment was his problem with Git is that is 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 not Git itself, but it's other people. You invested a lot of time to learn all of the obscure commands, to learn the tree structure, and so now you can get around and Git pretty well. And other people come along after him and blows everything away. They mess up your repository, right? Yeah. Okay. Do you do you think it's fair that you know people like? Um, uh, because a lot of people use version control other than programmers. I mean, they're data scientists. And you're, are you are you a non-programmer that uses? So a lot of people need to use version control other than programmers. You know, there's a, we. I wish that more scientists would use version control. 
Who wished that climate scientists would use version control? Okay, there you go. Um, but you know, it gets hard to use. You have to you have to spend a lot of time learning all these obscure commands to go between the five different things that you have to keep in mind. And so, uh, one one of the one of the funny quotes that I didn't didn't tell you about was I'll get to you in just a second. One of the funny quotes that I have that I didn't have a slide for was um. Uh, in order to effectively use Git, I'm, I'm quoting it from memory, you have to have the man page tattooed on your arm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and for the video people, the audience was saying, yes, you do. Okay, comment. Oh, the question. We, we wish that Congress would use version control. <laughs> and we have applause from the audience. Yes. Question, comment. All right, the comment from the audience was that he looked at the online documentation for, say, git push, which is a command which is very common. It's not something obscure, and the documentation makes no sense. Yep, push refs to remote repository. What does that mean, really? This, is, this goes back to the first comment where you have to, you know, the best way to learn git is to start with the data structures and then work up to the commands. Yeah, yeah and you're right. And... And there, if, if, if you're not a programmer, if you're not hardcore, if you're not a Klingon code warrior, you shouldn't have to learn this stuff. That's the point. Yes, comment. All right. All right, so I'm going to try and summarize that remarks. Uh, teaches robotics to high school students. They're new programmers, and Git is so complex that it's just beyond the ability uh, of a newbie to obtain. It's just a barrier to entry. You need to be a kernel hacker in order to really understand it. But on the other hand, we need to be teaching new programmers version control as a core skill. And they take one look at Git and turn around and change their major to history. Yes, a comment in the back. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay, look, 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 I'll just go ahead and say it. We're at the end. I, I developed Fossil. So, yeah, so Git in the in Fossil, right, okay. So the comment was that that uh, Git and Fossil and also Mercurial and Monotone are are commit oriented, whereas Darks is patch oriented. And and can I comment on that? And what what we should do is you and I should get together over lunch and you because I have never really understood Darks and I tried, but it just wasn't making sense to me. So, um, in in if you if you look at a graph, it, 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 the, the 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 patches are just the arcs between the nodes, right? And so, darks is really focused on the arcs, whereas Git's focused on the nodes. Is there is there a difference here that I'm I'm missing? Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to try and... All right, so the, so the point was made that, that darks can answer questions that Git cannot answer. And to just kind of summarize the remarks, I think it's that some, the idea of keeping track of patches works better for some people's way of thinking than keeping track of commits. And that may be the case. And I'm, I'm not opposed to that. I'm just, 
See, I'm not here to tear down yet. I'm trying to make it better. I'm hopeful that people would go out and, and, and really improve this. And really, if Git gets good enough, uh, I'll convert all of my fossil repositories over to Git and just start using that. But right now, it's not anything close to where I need it to be. So um, my point is to improve it for everybody. Any other comments or remarks, questions? Yes. Oh, yes, there's the, the famous Git man page generator. Yeah, I should have made a link to that. Just send me, send me that one because I'm going to put that in case I ever give this talk again. I also, you know, who's ever had a, if you've used Git, who's ever had a detached head? Yeah. Uh, did, you know, I just want to go back to my, you know, my first point. If you had this relational database keeping track of it, detached head becomes an impossibility. There are no more detached heads. It completely solves the detached head problem. I, I, I meant to mention that when I, I just forgot. We've, we've got to come up with, in addition to fixing Git, we need to come up with a new aid for presenters so that we can have points that we, you know, reminders here on the screen to, to tell us what we're forgetting. All right, and, 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 and Git Master here tells me that uh, he does detached heads on purpose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and so, so one person is saying he likes detached heads because he does them on purpose, and then somebody else says detached heads are all fun and games until you do it without meaning to. And it, it, and, and it will eventually garbage collect your detached heads, won't it? Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so your detached heads will go away. Yes. <laughs> okay, but, but with an approach like this, detached heads just appear. You know, on the little graphs that you get with your, your graphical interface, that, you know, it shows you the nice little graph of your history. The detached heads just appear there. And you can click on them and see what they're about. It's not some mystery that you have to go dig up out of a log. You don't have to remember that they're there. It just shows you. And you never lose them. Any other comments, questions? If you want to know more about the alternative, uh, you can meet me in the hall. I'll be happy to give you demonstrations and a, and a, and a sales talk. But uh, thank you for coming. Enjoy the conference. If the video is still going, I'm getting reports from the audience that the man page generator for Git is very funny. How do I mute this? Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. 
Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. Citrix Zen Server gives you everything you need to integrate, manage, and automate a virtual data center. All on an enterprise-class, cloud-proven virtual platform, and at a third of the cost of other solutions. But why even bother with virtualizing your server infrastructure in the first place? Well, let's say you have a traditional one-server-to-one application architecture, but you're running out of resources and performance is suffering. Once you order new server hardware, you'll wait for delivery. Configure it, install your business application, stage and test the server, and finally, add it to your production farm. If you've been through this process before, you know it can take weeks or even months. You also know it's a manually intensive process that will burden your team every time you outgrow your current setup. With a virtual server solution, you could accomplish all of that in less than half a day. Server virtualization software separates the OS and application from the underlying server hardware. And with multiple virtual machines on a single server, you can use each of them to run different OSs and applications. This makes it possible to move your virtual machines from one piece of hardware to another whenever you want, to maximize utilization, simplify maintenance, or recover from a hardware failure, and without slowing down your applications or users. Clearly, server virtualization provides big benefits, and Citrix Zen Server provides even more. Since it's built on an open platform, Zen Server plays well with your existing hardware, storage systems, and IT management software, as well as with the industry's leading cloud service providers. Best of all, you can get started by downloading a fully functional, production-ready version of Zen Server for free. After a 10-minute installation process, you'll see how easy it is to start virtualizing your workloads and automating your IT management processes. And when you're ready for a richer set of management tools, just upgrade to one of the premium editions of Zen Server. So whether you're interested in virtualizing servers for the first time, expanding your server virtualization footprint, or moving server workloads to the cloud, download and install Zen Server today and see how it can help you simplify your IT environment. Citrix Zen Server. Do more. Don't spend more. <laughs>